Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next episode of What's on Your Workbench. That's right. We are back for yet another episode of the greatest podcast you have ever seen. I feel like now that the circus is no longer a thing that it's legal to say that, maybe. Not sure. I don't know. I bet we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely, definitely a possibility. How are you doing, Chili? Is Chili uh, with me as always? Is my good friend Andrew. Andrew, how are you doing, buddy? I am doing good. I found a heater app in the workshop, and I'm testing it out because it's fairly cool this morning where I am, and it's kind of nice having warm feet. So if I if I kind of angle start this way, that's just because I'm getting closer and closer to heater, but. No, it's good. It's been good. Been a busy week as usual. Uh, how about you? It looks like from what I've seen on your Facebook feed, there's been a lot of um, metal work going on. But yeah, yes. it's, uh, how are you doing? Uh, pretty good. I would gladly package up some heat and send it to you. <laughs> uh, it's been disgusting and nasty and really, really hot weather to be wearing welding chaps and <laughs> burning wire. Oh, no, 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 but, no. We, we right. are enjoying the cool. It is, a, it is joyful over here to have three months where we can wear a hoodie or a jumper, and we don't have to worry about sweating all the time in the heat. So, uh, yes, you can, you can, you can keep your heat. I think you'll need it <laughs> in a few more months, anyway. Well, um, I know, uh, I know, we've both had quite a bit going on. And I'm eager to hear about about what you have been keeping your spare time filled with. So, Andrew, what's on your workbench, buddy? Well, let's see here. So, you know how I'm pretty normally just do boring projects around here and you really, it's pretty predictable what I'm going to be doing next. Um, so, this last week, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the stick insect. Uh, yeah. Okay, so they're, they're native to Australia and my wife was at her work and the gardener came up and went, here is a stick insect. And she went, oh, that's cool. And she collects insects, as normal people do. And she didn't have the heart to immediately put it in the freezer because apparently that's the humane way to dispose of an insect before you put it in your collection. Um, and anyway, so she wasn't, didn't quite have the heart to do that. So she wanted to keep it as a pet for a while. So, here is the Insect Keeper 2000. <laughs> All uh, right. For, for those of you that can't see, it is a, or let's call it about a two foot by foot by, it's a foot by foot square and about a foot and a half high um, wooden construction with just um, like window mesh kind of around the edge. So, or yeah. Um, but yeah, so this is what I was working on last weekend in the morning. And um, we'll get to the crux of what everybody actually cares about. Um, well, it turns out the reason why the gardener could actually capture and found the stick insect was because pretty well it was already dead. So it only lasted a day or two. And um, yeah, so now it's just sitting out the shed. But <laughs> see, very predictable I am. It's so boring what I'm talking about. But Anyway, so, but this is, this is actually the kind of project that I really enjoy because it's that balance of, do I get it done? Is it doing it just enough? Because I knew the stick effect, even if it was fine, they only live for a few months here and there and, you know, we might get another one. So it was kind of like, well, I don't want to spend two weeks building this thing that might only, you know, might not last long enough for the project to be finished. So it had to be done quick. But I also didn't want it to be, you know, like it's just going to fall apart the next day kind of thing. So there's actually that real that real balance of trying to get it done out, turned out quick, and then have it still be fairly reasonable. And it's not, I mean, by no stretch of the imagination is it perfect, um, but it is fairly solid. Um, and I got to kind of play around with my bandsaw a little bit, making some kind of non-straight cuts. So that was that was good fun. So. Um, just to kind of go a bit over the construction, I've got, I had a base plate of pine 
um, and I just cut some notches in it with the bandsaw. And then I just had some offcuts of various sizes um, for, the, for the vertical uprights. Um, I glued them and stapled them with the pneumatic stapler. Um, cross beams, cross beams, and then I just had some mesh and inside and I just stapled that with a regular staple gun um, for the lid. Um, pretty well the same construction, just some pine um, with some reinforcing along it. Um, no screws, it was all just done with glue and the pneumatic, pneumatic nailer or pin nailer. Um, and then the handle was just some kind of freehand on the bandsaw to try and get an organic kind of shape, which really didn't work, but um, <laughs> it, it, it does, fu it's functional. We'll call it functional. That's a nice way of putting it these days. It's functional. Um, but yeah, and I got to kind of learn that, okay, the blade that I've probably got on my bandsaw is not really fit for kind of that free, free motion and that. But um, yeah, no, it turned out I was quite pleased with it in the end. I think it took me oh, a couple of hours on Saturday morning to kind of throw it together. And yeah, and eventually if I um, went back and did it again, because the mesh is quite loose on the inside, I would probably, you can kind of see oh, that cross beam I've got going in there. I would basically go along the tops and the bottoms and I would push it out um, and basically try and wedge it and tighten it up a little bit. But uh, as for now, it's probably just going to live out in the shed until we find another stick insect or some other creature that needs a home for a couple of days. And um, yeah, in spring, yeah, the uh, <laughs> the kids can grab caterpillars and have a have a butter, have a little butterfly pavilion. Yep, exactly. So yeah, it's nice. it's, ac it's actually quite funny because I rooted, I made one of these back when I was in grade twelve or grade 11, grade 12. I, always, I was always interested in animals as kids and I was I always liked insects. And so I, in Australia, you can get these Goliath stick insects, which are like about a foot long. And um, I always wanted one. And finally I found one where I could buy it and then I had to make the construction. And if you want to talk about like last week, how we're talking about design, that was one of the most over-designed things I've ever made. Um, it was a octagon of um, like basically I had eight, individual panels and four of them were fixed two were hinged to each other and so you could basically open it up halfway um, and I think I had some dowel kind of helping holding it open and yeah it was all mesh and at that point obviously I didn't have staple guns I didn't have any of that so I'd actually used thumbtacks to hold the um the mesh in place I'd painted it up uh, but it was all varnished I even used I was using calculus at school at the time and I was like, cool, I can optimize the volume on the area and I can minimize my area by maximizing my volume. Well, it turns out, you know, it was most of these things, the, the way to do that is to have this really flat boxy thing and ended up just going, um, yeah, I'll just design it how I want it to look good. And I actually had that for a few years and um, I, my insect eventually died and I, of course, varnished it and stuck it to the wall for a while and then my wife was studying entomology and she actually got given some stick insects, leaf insects. And so they took up residence there and then actually carted it around the world for a few years. And then eventually I went, hmm, don't think I need it anymore. I'm going to throw that out. And then two, three years later, I needed it again. But yeah, so that is that is what I've been working on. Questions, queries? So Yeah, so first <laughs> I just want to say that I think for um, for episode three, of the uh of the critter cage saga uh i think you should build a, a geodesic dome <laughs> i don't know wouldn't they just like roll and I, <laughs> I only no just just the dome yeah okay yeah like yeah. I, I only say it because now it's going to be stuck in your head and you'll probably end up doing it which i find hilarious <laughs> Maybe, maybe. We'll see. We'll see. I, I think I um, succeeded with this one in that it's good enough that I can look at it and be like, it's good enough. It's good enough. Let's let's talk, let's talk about the handle a little bit. That's okay. that's what I'm really drawn to. So first of all, what uh what are the specs on your bandsaw blade? It has a blade and it cuts. Okay. <laughs> no, it's um, it's it's 
probably about an inch wide or no, not probably quite like maybe three quarters of an inch. Um, so it's not like a real narrow blade. Um, it's not a, it's not a fine cut, but it's not like a super aggressive cut. So I'd call it like a medium cut, which is why I'd say it's on there just a bit of all round. Um, so I think it it's can a, handle. Uh, yeah. It's a, a 10 inch bandsaw, right? I don't the know. the diameter of the wheels is about yeah I'd say ten inch yep okay yep. that sounds about right um, <laughs> so I I would guess I would venture to guess that it's probably a half inch blade okay on there yeah because that's usually about the largest you can put on on a ten okay. inch yeah that would that um, would make sense so over there which will really be. See. That that is set up for a, a half inch blade is what you would use for making nice straight cuts. Um, it's very difficult to make uh, radiuses with a half inch unless yep. it's a very very low swept curve. Yeah. Um, and so if if we were going to optimize your your setup for that, um, I would probably look at doing uh, about probably a blade that has about eight teeth per inch okay yep. um, even six would be okay yep um and i'd probably put on about probably like a, a quarter or three eighths inch blade yep. um three eighths i think would be fine for that you're not doing real tight curves on that no um and uh and you would find that you'd get a real uh, a real nice smooth radius that way yeah even free handing yeah um and then um you know that that blade you have is probably going to be amazing for straight cuts once you get um a fence on there i know you got to build a fence yeah um but yeah you'll be able to get some real nice straight cuts out of that yeah and i mean that made a lot of sense when i was doing it it was like it really wanted to just stay straight which was you know fine and i'm still learning how to use it and that's kind of it's it's not like using that when i was building this it was super nice just having it set up in the corner and i just needed to you know make some quick cuts it was just do, 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 do. well i always have got to pull out the jigsaw or i usually have to decide it's like do, am i going to hand saw am i going to jigsaw am i going to circular saw well this is like it's there and then did you and use it. it to cut those corner notches out of the base yep. plate yep yep that just, um that worked really well for that highly important safety note yep uh for anybody listening and for a band saw not not like a scroll saw um a scroll saw yep. you can back out of a cut yep you cannot do that on a band saw okay because uh, the teeth can actually catch on the sides of your curve okay and pull that blade off the wheel oh okay yep. yeah i see um and anybody who's ever opened a bandsaw blade from its coiled position knows yep. that they're pretty wicked yep um we actually uh guys actually make what they call bear traps out of uh bandsaw blades and it's usually done as a practical joke to scare a newbie yep uh, but you, you twist it up only halfway um so it's kind of like like two u's facing yep. each other um and you drop that on the floor right behind someone and it makes a real loud sound, especially yep. on a large bandsaw blade. And it'll it'll scare the daylights out of you. But if you're not careful, it'll it'll cut the crud out of you too. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine if it's a new blade or whatever. But no, that's good to know. I that makes sense now that you said it. But yeah, I definitely wasn't I was pulling out on that. So it's good to know not to do that. Which with the size of those cuts, yeah, you probably weren't in too much danger of anything. But um, it's just one of those things. It's good practice. Good practice. Yep. Um, no, but yeah, and no, so, I, I do have a bunch of blades that came with it, but that was just the one that was on it. So I'll have to have a look and see what what's available. And but yeah. <laughs> and then on that handle, you have a set of uh, a chisels, right? Like bench chisels. Uh, yeah. Um, that would be an excellent thing to practice pairing cuts on okay uh to smooth out those transitions 
Um, and so for anybody who's not familiar, a paring cut with a chisel is, is taking a very small, almost like slabs of material off at a time. So you're not gouging down in, you're just taking a very shallow pass yep. and you're usually sweeping um, for anybody who's watching on YouTube, they can see this, but you're sweeping the chisel left to uh, right or okay. right to left as you're, as you're pushing so that you're really making a slice uh, through the wood. And that would be a good thing to one, just practice pairing cuts on, but two, uh, also practice your, uh, you know, your sharpening of your chisels yep. and see how you're doing on that, um, which we're going to talk about a little bit in the next episode when we talk about tool maintenance. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really awesome little thing that if you screw up your pairing cut, it's not going to be a big deal. Yeah. Um, uh, and there's a lot of, you know, just kind of facets on that right now that you'll be able to work on smoothing out by hand. Yep. Yeah. And so, and then, the, I mean, I guess every time I do a project like this, I just fall in love with pneumatic tools because just being able to go, just, uh, I mean, for me, it's just usually I'm using old screws or nails that I've had from other projects. And so I've got to try and find the right, but with that, obviously I've got all the nails and the um, staples ready to go. So it's, yep, just find the right length and off we go. So yeah, so the other thing was, uh, can I see your top corners? Those I'm ones? interested to see how oh. you did your joinery up there. <laughs> are you really? Are you really? Yeah. It, it's just a staple pretty well straight through. Okay. So you did butt joints on it. Yeah. 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 Nice. Yeah. <clears throat> It was very, very rough and quick, but it's, I mean, like a stick insect is not an elephant. They don't, um, I mean, I know you, most people aren't aware of that, but um, yeah, it's, it's a, they're pretty gentile creatures. So they don't, they don't really cause too much havoc, um, yeah, which is nice. And it's not like, it's not like trying to make an enclosure for like caterpillars, which will get out of tiny, tiny cracks. Yeah. Um, that's a little bit more of a pain. But yeah, yeah exactly. you don't have to worry about that. Yeah, and it's always and it's always like a saying that balance of oh, I can do this better, I can do this better, do I do it better? Do I just call it good? And um yeah, I think I kind of I'm pretty happy with the balance I got on that one. It's it's definitely one of those things that it'll work, but it's not gonna if if I drop it tomorrow and it breaks, I'm not gonna lose any sleep over it. <laughs> yep, yep. So the other thing I was looking at, um just out of my the way my brain works as I'm looking at it and partially because I recently built this so now I'm like finding any and every application I can for it but for the screens what would have been I think really cool is on your uprights yep. uh, and your uh, spreaders on top and bottom I think what I probably would have done uh, is I would have used my kerf plane and put a kerf in in those on the inside diameter um, and then still use screen like you did, but that would then give you the opportunity to use, yeah, to use the uh, the rubber, the hard rubber stuff that you yeah. actually use the window screen yep. um, and tuck it in and get it real nice and tight. Yep. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that I did actually have a whole bunch of offcuts which had curves in it and I did think about that but at the time I was just like by the time I try and slide it all in there and make it all neat I'm just like nope 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 yeah yes. just the hard thing about that <clears throat> is that you could do two of the opposing sides as you know rectangular frames and get the get the screen in there really easily and what I'm not sure about then is how you would do the adjacent two sides. I would probably do them. Together. I'd probably do them offline and then just bring them all together and then just do mm. join them along the long edge. Yep. It's probably yeah, that what I would well. do. Um, Cause like the way I did this is I used that base and those cutouts as like the main structure. But if you, if you did, if you actually did proper, you know, screens, 
if you made them structural, then you could just have those four joined together and the base and the top wouldn't really need to be anywhere near as important, yeah. which was how I pretty well built my original back many, many years ago. Because, yeah, because the my original one that I built, I wanted it to open up so that I could put in like a vase full of leaves. Um, and so I had to have a fairly wide open. With this one, I was like, well, I'm, whatever I do, I'm just going to come in from the top. It's not a, not a concern. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, it's it's definitely one of those ones where it's like once you start thinking about it, you're like, oh, this could you could make this look really good if you wanted. It's like, no, it needs to be done. <laughs> so that leads us on to what is on your workbench, Chili? Well, uh, um, as we alluded to earlier, um, I'm sketching some stuff out here real quick to show you as as we're talking about this, but yep. I have been busy uh, with the MIG welder. Um, okay. I am making those uh, those flower yep. stands that we talked about uh, before. So the first one of them is a metal frame. Um, and it is, <laughs> you want to talk about over-engineered. Um, what I had access to in terms of square tubing is um, 11 gauge, okay. which is about eighth inch. Yep. And it's, it's structural steel. Yeah. Um, so this, this flower stand, just the frame of it and the sheet metal basin uh, is over like 120 pounds. <laughs> Ooh. It's not going uh, anywhere once it gets put in place. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, but what I what I want to talk so generally it's about 18 inches deep and 48 inches wide, uh, three foot tall. Yep. So it's four posts, um, rails and styles uh, on the top, and then about an inch and a half from the bottom, there's another set of rails and styles that will hold a shelf. Yep. Um, the top holds the sheet metal basin that I made. Um, and that's just, let's see, one, two, three, four, five pieces of, of sheet steel that I cut and folded by hand, uh, hammered angles at the bottom to hold the bottom sheet, tack welded it and siliconed that. Yep. Um, and then the bottom of that basin is at an angle towards the back okay, and yep. there's a slit at the back. So this bottom piece will come out all the way past okay. the wood angle down and provide nice drainage okay yeah because originally last um, last week you were talking about having some maybe sort of brass fitting or something like that yeah the more that. i thought about that i realized you know there's a really good chance of that clogging over yep. time um even if i used a fairly decent size uh fitting and, and copper tubing it it probably was not going to have good longevity and i liked this design a lot better in terms of you know longevity and working properly um yeah so that's kind of how i changed that up a little bit uh but what i want to talk about a little bit so the bottom rails are butt joints yep they're just butted straight up against the upright legs and welded all the way around but the top rails and styles i did um, a little bit differently um, and used some different joinery to make it a cleaner uh, connection. And it also really helps in setup um, to get good solid 90 degree angles because you have 90 degrees on three axes that you're trying to get. So I'm gonna show you what I did and I'll kind of talk through it too for those who are listening on the podcast. So if this is my top of my, uh, my piece of, of square stock, hollow yep. square stock. On two adjacent sides, I cut a 45 degree angle from the shared corner at the end and did 45 degree angles on adjacent sides uh, with opposing slopes. Yep. So it leaves me kind of like a, a cathedral point. And then if you turn that around on the back side, I cut those flat. Yep. So it's it's just I just kind of lowered basically the length of the tube. 
So you can see kind of there's a little bit of a dotted line there that shows you, you know, if that were to go all the way around, that's where it would be. Yep. Um, so if you do that on three pieces of, of tube, they fit together perfectly at 90 degree angles on all three axes. Yep. And it makes it a lot easier to tack that joint together and maintain those 90s on all three axes. Um, it's a little bit more time in your cut Set because up. you have to cut that by hand with an angle grinder. Um, but it saves so much headache trying to get, you know, clean, flat welds. Um, these ones are going to be covered up by cedar planking. Yeah. Um, but when I'm doing a piece that the metal shows, um, it also helps to create um, cleaner, seamless welds. Um, if you don't want them to show, you know, you want to have a nice sleek piece that looks like it's all one piece. Um, this, this makes it a lot easier to get that look. Yep. Yeah. It's, this is definitely one of those techniques that people that always show up on my Facebook feed and they'll have like people like cutting all different metals and then, yeah. And you're like, that doesn't work. That can't work. Or you're like, oh, that's easy. That'll be, yeah. And then you're, the way you're describing this exactly. I remember seeing one where they, they put it together and they weld it and then they grind it off flat and it looks, you know, absolutely perfect as if, you know, anybody could do it. And it's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's quite a bit of skill behind what that guy just did. <laughs> well, the nice thing about doing smooth joints and not showing your weld is it doesn't matter how beautiful your weld is, yep. which for me right now, is kind of important because I don't have the electrical service in this house Ooh. that I need for my welder to run continuously. Okay. Yep. Um, I have to basically spot weld everything. Yep. Um, which I've, I've gotten to the point that my spot welds look pretty dang nice, <laughs> um, but it's just not the same as doing a continuous bead yep. um, that I can do and have nice presentable, you know, well, yep. um, but yeah, as you're learning how to weld, it's, you know, it's great to do flush, you know, continuous seams. Yeah. Nice. So you're happy with how it's all been coming along then? Yeah. Is, I'm is really there any, happy. I, is there I any... took some of my oh, off sorry. cuts of the tube um, and cut uh, the sides of some of them off. Um, so that I had four flat plates and I welded those to the bottom of the feet um, to close them in. Um, and then I ended up drilling through those and welding on um, three eighths inch nuts over the holes. Yep. And then I put some adjustable feet on it uh, because this is going to be sitting on a patio mm. of a condo. And that patio is going to be sloped away from the structure, at least yep. it should be, should be if that's built correctly, <laughs> um, to shed water away from the foundation. Uh, but you don't want your planter to be sitting at an angle. Otherwise, you know, your, your plants that are further away from the house are going to get more water than the plants up closer to the house. So I put adjustable feet on it so we can level it on the patio and make sure we have a nice uh, flat surface, um, which will also mean that the uh, bottom of it will be sloped correctly to shed excess water out. Yep. Oh, very good. Is there any concern when you're doing that metal? I mean, I, I assume the metal's pretty thick, but when you're doing those tack welds, is it potential for it to bend or move under that heat? Um, or is so that... Uh, on the 11 gauge steel, um, what you have to worry about when you're doing your, your first tack welds to just hold the pieces together, um, the weld itself will move the steel. So if you don't have a really high-end fab table um, to hold everything you know, in place as those welds are, are heating and cooling, um, you will get some movement. And I don't have one of those tables. Like that's, you're talking like six grand for a table. Yeah. Not to mention all the, accessories that go with it to actually hold stuff in place yeah. um and those tables really are they work a lot like a woodwork bench that has uh you know dogs yeah. to hold stuff down 
same thing. Um, it's just they're all clamping down instead of just pounding down. Yep. Um, so so what you have to do is you get your your joints you know set up to your ninety, and you get your first tack weld on. So if I've got an upright here, and I've got a, a horizontal going off to the well, my right. Yep. Um, I'm going to put my first tack weld on the outside of that joint or on the left. Yep. When I do that, there's going to be a ton of heat that goes into that material. And the material that I'm adding with my weld is super hot. As that cools, it will contract and it will pull my upright at an angle away from my horizontal. So I'll now have an obtuse angle. So from that point, before you put your tack weld on the other side, you want to make sure that you correct it and get it upright again and get it to your 90. And then you put your tack weld on the opposing side. Yep. Now, when I do those, I try to do them as close to the middle of the material as I can, uh, especially in this application where I'm working on three axes because then what I'm gonna have to do is make my tack welds on the opposing sides and uh, make sure that my 90 degree on the other axis is there as well. Okay. So there's actually some pictures on my, on my social media of doing this and you'll see in a couple of them that uh, I have ratchet straps uh, wrapped around in different places. And those are strategically placed because I did my top frame first and made sure that was perfectly flush and square. And once that was fully welded, you know, it's not going anywhere. So as I'm doing these legs, um, I could ratchet strap from that mm. uh, square tube um, in the finished frame up to the top of the leg and use those ratchet straps to pull my leg uh, parallel before yep. I finish my weld. Yep. So it's just a really ghetto table, basically. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I only ever use the highest of quality products. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. There's, there's a lot of folks that, you know, <clears throat> really are under the impression that you have to have, you know, all these fancy tools to get stuff done. And really, things like those fab tables, 20 years ago, they, they didn't exist, yeah. let alone 50, 60 years ago. Yep. And, and yet, you know, we had welders building, you know, skyscrapers and, you know, and, and weapons of war like airplanes and tanks and stuff, and they didn't have it. Well, guess what? That's because there's enough other way to do it. Yeah, exactly. And it's, yeah, clamps and straps and stuff, it's... They can get you. A, they can get you a long way. I mean, it's. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's definitely one of the things you look at. Though, I mean, for me, it's the woodworking workbenches where you see all of that extra stuff. You're like, oh, that would be useful. That would be useful. But I mean, I've found as long as you've got enough clamps, and I've ended up drilling a few holes in my table so I can get, I can set clamps in the middle of my table, and I'm pretty well set now. It's it does seem to work well enough, and I guess it's just figuring out what your project is and making sure you've got just enough to do that you don't need everything to do stuff you're never going to do so it's yeah it's definitely welding is definitely one of those black arts to me i've never been around it um i'm not it's not that i'm afraid of it it's just i've never had a reason to kind of do it but my wife is actually fairly interested she really wants to one day make like wind sculptures um so hopefully one day she'll have some time yeah. and she can go do that so to go back to your, your heat question, though, and warping, mm. the sheet steel is where that really becomes a problem. Yeah. Um, so I was using 20-gauge sheet steel, which is pretty thin. Yeah. Um, and to give you an idea, like on, a, on an old car, on a classic car, that sheet metal is like 18-gauge. Yeah. It's a little bit thicker. Um, a modern car is like rice paper. Yeah. I mean... You cannot weld on that. You can't do that kind of repair that you can on an old car. Yeah. Um, so that 20 gauge sheet will warp. I couldn't run a bead no. on that if I wanted to. 
yep. um, or if I had, you know, the right electrical capabilities here, I still couldn't do that because it would dance all over the place. So sheet steel, you always have to tack. Yeah, and I actually learned that talking to my father who's doing, they've done a bunch of metal work on the car he's working on. And he was saying the exact same thing that you just tack and work around and then work back. And, and it doesn't matter because whatever you do, you're going to grind back and um, bondo in and fiberglass over and, you know, paint over. So it's not, yeah. nobody's going to be seeing those welds. So it just needs to be structural and the tacks are fine. And yeah, like you said, if you, if you go to get it heated up too much, you'll just warp all your work you've done. So yeah, yeah it all kind of... it's a lot like it's a lot like tightening the lug nuts on your car you have to go you know in that star pattern to make sure you don't warp the wheel oh huh. well <laughs> it's the same thing when you're doing tack welds uh on sheet metal you you just kind of skip around yeah and give that area Keep time even... for the heat to dissipate before you come back to it yeah or even if it does warp a little bit it's warping equally across the whole piece not just all in one place first and then yeah. all in another place place second so no very good i am sure one day we will get some welding happening on my side and we can have lots of lessons learned about that i'm, yeah. I'm looking forward to it because i've heard it's just like hot glue it's it's basically the same oh yeah same thing <laughs> Cool. All right. Well, if people want to find more of you, Chili, where can they find more about you and what you are working on? Yeah. If you want to see the shenanigans that I'm up to, you can find me on Facebook at Orwood Solutions, uh, Instagram at Orwood CS, uh, or YouTube, uh, which is also Orwood Solutions. And uh, of course, you can always check out my website, which is not updated anywhere near as often, uh, but that is OrwoodSolutions.com. How about you, Andrew? So you can find me at craftybeatrick.com and unfortunately my website is in a similar state. Um, most of my stuff's up on YouTube under craftybeatrick.com. You can find these podcasts on what's on your workbench um, on YouTube and also what's on your workbench.podbean.com. Uh, if you are listening to this, we would love it if you could subscribe or um, give us positive reviews or any reviews or just listen to us would be great. Um, tell your friends if you're interested. If you've got any comments, feel free to pass them on through the various channels. Uh, so we've got a bit of a special episode coming up next. Um, do we want to give a bit of a teaser as to what that may be? Well, I, I kind of already let the cat out. Kind of, the kind of already <laughs> did. Kind of. But uh, yeah, we're going to talk about tool maintenance. My specialty. <laughs> but... Anyway, uh, we will catch you all next week when we find out what's on your way. Thank you.